the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be speaking today about the topic of predict and optimize. Some other tutorials have or will touch uh, on related questions. I'm going to provide one perspective. Almost every tutorial speaker has said this. I will provide a biased perspective, so I, need to, I feel the need to say that again. Uh, this is based on joint work with my PhD student, uh, Bo Tang, uh, who's done an incredible effort in developing uh, PIAPO, uh, which is pronounced like pineapple, hence the pineapple, uh, which is a package for end-to-end -end predict and optimize, that's the EPO, um, in Python. Okay, so uh, that tool will be uh, the main tool we're going to use in the second part uh, in the hands-on uh, tutorial, uh, but I will also introduce it at a high level towards the end of this talk. Okay? So the talk is structured as a tutorial to the question of predict and optimize, overview of some you know, issues, methods, um, and then the package, and some findings from empirical evaluation of ex some existing methods. Okay? I'm happy to take any questions uh, throughout, so please don't hesitate to interrupt if something is unclear. Um, so uh, I will be looking mainly at problems with linear objective functions, potentially integer variables. Uh, don't care too much about the feasible set uh, for now, whether it's convex, non-convex, uh, except for integrality. Okay. Um, so how do we address such problems? Tia has talked uh, about this extensively, using uh, an appropriate algorithm depending on the type of problem that you have. Okay, MIP, CP, LP, uh, a custom approximation algorithm, uh, whatever. All right. So now uh, let's consider the case where we have n such optimization problems um, defined by different objective uh, function coefficients. These are the vectors C1 through Cn. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that the feasible set is the same. Okay. So the meanings of the variables and the constraints that they might satisfy don't vary across the n problems. Okay. Um, so same decision variables. Uh, I'm going to call decision variables w, not x as usual. You'll see why we use x for features. Uh, so to keep things clear, we're going to use w for decision variables. Um, so these n vectors can be kind of completely unrelated doesn't help me uh, too much. I have n optimization problems. Um, I can run the solver on each of them independently and get some solution. OK, now let's make the setting a bit more involved. Uh, let's assume that each instance of the optimization problem has a corresponding feature vector, okay, which is observed. Some feature vector xi that lives in, say, p-dimensional space. Okay? So it's a vector that kind of describes some properties of this instance. I'll give a concrete example uh, of a path type problem in a bit. And now, uh, let's assume that the costs depend on the feature vector. Okay? So the cost, uh, the cost function coefficients um, are some function g of the feature vector x. Okay? That function is parameterized by some vector theta. Okay? that determines the shape of this function. Okay? So for example, if this is a linear function, right, theta could be the weights of the linear combinations of the entries of the feature vector xi. Okay? If it's a quadratic model, it would be the weights of that, and so on and so forth. All right. Um, if you know theta in this setting, then uh, you can simply pass x through g, get c, and solve the optimization problem with your solver. Okay? So, so far, no problem, nothing new. Now, what if you don't know theta, okay, and you only observe the feature vectors xi? Okay? I still want to solve this optimization problem, uh, but I don't know the objective function. Okay? Um, it's not a completely black box problem, though, because I know something that can hint at the objective function. Namely, I know the feature vector. Okay? Um, I can simply uh, you know, pass uh, xi, obtain some estimate c hat i, okay? now plug the estimate in the objective and solve that problem. Okay? Now the central task becomes, what is this function g? How do I get these parameters theta that could lead to good c hats? 
Um, so let's formalize the setting uh, even further. So we're going to assume that these n instances are training instances that I have from a historical uh, set of observations. Okay, so I've solved my optimization problem in the past, say, once every day for a few months. Every one of those days is some vector xi. Okay, and I solved the corresponding optimization problem. And let's also now assume that the true cost vector, which I told you was unknown at the time of optimization, for historical data, reveals itself at some point. Okay, so it becomes observed after the fact. If I tell you to solve the optimization problem today, you don't have C. You have to use X to get some C hat. Okay, but looking backwards, you can recover what were the cost function coefficients. Again, I'll make this concrete in one second. All right. Now the learning problem becomes, given a, train a training data set D consisting of pairs, features xi, and labels that are the cost function coefficient ci, so these are both vectors, xi in rp, and ci in uh, whatever the dimension of w is, D, rd. Okay? Given this data set, learn a theta that approximates the ground truth cost vectors well. Okay? Is the problem statement clear? Okay, good. All right. So, how would we train a machine learning model at a high level to achieve such a task? Okay, so this is a simple flow diagram. You get the data set that I just described. It goes into some model, say a neural network, something that has gradients we can compute with respect to its parameters. That model outputs a prediction of the cost function coefficients. And then you have some loss function, which measures some notion of prediction error. This is the usual supervised learning pipeline. The arrows back are maybe gradients that help you tune the thetas, the parameters of your machine learning model. Okay? It's a standard gradient-based learning pipeline. Uh, now, at test time, this is training at the top. At test time, now you have th this model and you have some parameters data for it, right? How do you use it? A new data point feature vector comes in. You need to solve the optimization problem. You predict the cost coefficients with the model. And now you get some prediction C hat. You plug that as an objective function in your solver, and then you solve the problem and you get a corresponding solution, W star C. Okay? W star to say it's optimal, C to say with respect to uh, some vector C. Okay? All right. So now let's make this more concrete. Okay? Well, why is this abstraction useful? Uh, let's consider a shortest path setting. Um, uh, let's say, you know, through a map application similar to, go to Google Maps. These are screenshots I took a, a while back. Um, from, uh, from Montreal of the same area, okay? And uh, let's assume we're doing ST shortest path for uh, fixed starting uh, and terminal nodes S and T. So these are the blue and the yellow squares respectively, okay? Now what's varying is these queries may be made at different times of day, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 p.m., and so on, okay? Each of these contexts produces a feature vector, x1, x2, x3, x4. So by now, it should be clear what I mean by a feature vector corresponding to an optimization instance. Okay? It's something that tells me about the context of when the optimization is occurring. Okay? Um, now, what are the Cs? The Cs, in a shortest path problems, what's the cost? The cost is the travel time on an edge in a given graph. Right? Here, the graph is the road network. Okay? Um, and the travel time on an edge of the road network, that's my C, okay? And if I take a particular edge, say this one, road segment, um, then it has cost C1K in instance one, C2K in instance two, and so on. I'm indexing it by K, okay? All right, so this is what my data basically looks like, and say the weather is changing over time, traffic conditions, anything that I observe. Okay, and, and for sure you can think of anything like Google Map, Waze, whatever, is solving a problem like this one, right? Because you make a query from A to B, it doesn't give you an abstract travel time, for example, for driving. 
right? It takes into account, for example, traffic and so on. So it needs to solve a shortest path problem on top of travel times which may be unknown and that are estimated based on historical data. Okay? All right. So uh, let's put the example into the pipeline. Your predictive model for the shortest path case becomes a travel time prediction model. Uh, which gives you a regression, right, an estimate of the travel time for each road segment. So this is what the model must try to achieve. And then you take the predicted travel times and you plug them into the objective function of shortest path. Okay? So here you have to think, uh, you know, shortest path ob objective function is x, you see times x, right, where c is the travel time on an edge, and x is binary, do I take this edge in my shortest path or not? Okay? Then you sum them up, you get the actual total travel time. Right? Any questions? Yes. Yes. No, my theta, good question. So the question is, what is theta here? Theta are still the parameters of some model, say some neural network, which is predicting the travel times. Okay? So if it's a linear regression model, let's say, then the model behaves such that theta times x gives you c hat. So theta regulates the predictions. Good. Other questions? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. So the question is, why are we only predicting objective function coefficients, travel time in this case, not any constraints? For example, the road network itself might have some disturbances, right? A road segment is completely closed. A node in the network is completely unavailable, meaning all of its edges uh, are cut off. Um, <clears throat> that can certainly be a realistic problem. So you can have a predict and optimize with predictions in the constraints. Um, I will not talk about this. I will mention in the last slide a reference to a recent paper that has uh, from, from, from colleagues that touches on the problem. But we'll see later on that there's an inherent um, theoretical issue with uh, predictions and the constraints. Mainly, uh, infeasibility ruins clean learning like I'm going to show it. The objective function, you know, errors are easy. You mispredict the objective function, okay, you get a bad solution. But if you mispredict a constraint, you can make a problem that's infeasible, feasible, or vice versa. And accounting for the error of that is a philosophical question. Yeah, great question. Okay, yes. Uh huh, good. So, so the follow up is if that information is available in the constraints, meaning I don't need to predict it. Right? Let's say Google knows that a certain road segment is blocked because it takes data from the city or whatever. Then you can, of course, modify the LP or whatever solver for shortest path and say you cannot take this edge or you cannot take this node. For sure. Yes. Good. All right. Let's keep the questions uh, coming. Okay. Uh, now the key issue that arises is what is the loss function? How do I train these thetas? Okay. Here's a candidate. Uh, which is a squared error between the, the ground truth travel times and the predicted travel times. Okay? Just regression. I mean, I did say the model is a regression model, so why not train it like we, tra we fit or train standard regression models? Okay? All right. Let's see why not. Um, so a lot of the work in this area is actually uh, kind of was initiated in this one paper. Um, and uh, it's not a 2022 paper, it's a 2017 paper, but it took them uh, five years to publish it uh, in management science because the reviewers uh, couldn't accept that you cannot just predict the coefficients accurately. Okay? And this example should demonstrate why, uh, why this may be confusing. Okay? So <clears throat> here I'm going to take a very simple shortest path example. Uh, from the paper, so I've just animated it a little bit. You have a graph like this one. You need to go from S to T in the shortest length possible. Okay? So clearly there are 
you know, starting from S, you have to go either through edge one or edge two, okay? Regardless of what you do with the other two edges. I'm not gonna worry about that here. Um, what you're seeing here on the first plot is a function of the features. These are the features of each edge, X. Um, and on the vertical axis, you're seeing the actual cost of traversing an edge. And the two functions that you're seeing here correspond to the circles, correspond to edge one, and the squares correspond to edge two. Okay? So higher values for the same x means it's more expensive to traverse that edge. Right? Um, how do we solve uh, shortest path problems when we have non-negative edge costs? Anybody know an algorithm for that? Dijkstra, great. So Dijkstra is going to take the greedy decision, right? Um, so naturally, if you're at S, you safely can see what is, you know, the nearest, uh, the shortest edge, and take that. Okay. So keep that in mind. Now, there's a transition in this graph. Before point, roughly 1.25, the circles are above the squares. Squares corresponds to edge two, meaning it's cheaper to take edge two. What this means is that if you observe a feature value, here we have one-dimensional features. So each edge has only one feature x. That's why I can plot this with one feature only. If your x is less than 1.25, you should always take edge 2. Once you cross 1.25, edge 1 becomes cheaper to take. Okay? So this tells you how to apply Dijkstra, depending on the context that you observe. Right? So if you knew these curves, and I only showed you x, it's very easy to make an optimal decision. Clear? OK, but we don't know these curves. So we need to estimate them. What you're seeing in red is, what if I had observed these samples, these dots, and I just fit two regression models, one for edge one and one for edge two? OK, so uh, now, of course, somebody should come and say, I already detected the problem with your approach. These don't look nothing like lines, so we are fitting lines, right? These look like quadratics, more like. OK, so that's a separate issue. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but let's assume we fit lines, OK? You fit lines, and now you make decisions based on the lines, not the points, which are the historical data. So now if I had the lines, the breakpoint at which edge one becomes optimal shifts to the left. So although these two lines fit the data quite well, meaning their mean squared error, if you were to measure it, is probably optimal, very low. The breakpoint when it comes to decision making shifts, meaning in this region between 0 0.9 and 1.25, the most accurate predictive model gives suboptimal shortest path decisions. Okay? Questions? All right. Now, the paper here and one of the methods I'm going to propose which is, or present, which is SPO+, uh, does something very funky. I mean, this alone should tell you why the paper was very hard to get accepted. Basically, they said, like three pages in, this is the right thing to do. Do these curves look like regr good regression lines to the data? I mean, nothing like, like, like good regression, right? But they yield optimal decision making. Okay? So if you had fit these and taken the shortest path Dijkstra decision based on that, you would recover the true unknown optimal solutions with the unknown true objective coefficients. Okay? And a lot of the work in predict and optimize is how do I get these? Um, but I'll show you at the end you can potentially get the best of both. Okay? This is an extreme situation. All right, so this is the setting we're in. Is it clear that predict and optimize is not just a standard prediction problem? Any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's fair. We, we care about something else, basically. Uh, if we if we can achieve that by predicting the right coefficients, great. Uh, but if we can't, we have to do something else. So I'll I'll discuss when it makes sense to just predict the coefficients versus when you need to do something else. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. Uh, 
Now, to quantify this notion of loss, so we can think about training models, um, uh, we introduce the notion of decision error, okay, or regret. Um, very simple uh, to define. So the regret between a predicted cost vector C hat and a true cost vector C for a minimization problem is the value of the solution you get by optimizing for C hat multiplied by the true cost of that solution, which is with respect to C, minus the optimal value of the problem when you optimize with respect to C. Okay? So you optimize with respect to C hat, you get a solution, you multiply that by C, which is what the actual costs are, and then you subtract the true optimal value. So because this is, I'm assuming, a minimization problem here, the thing on the right will always be smaller than the thing on the, of the left. So this quantity is always non-negative. Okay? So the best you could do, say, is a solution with cost 2.2, and this is 3.2, so your regret is 1. Okay? The only tricky part is just to see why there's C here and C hat here. Okay? I optimize with respect to C hat, so W star C hat means I run the solver with objective function C hat. It gives me a solution that I'm going to call W star C hat, and then I multiply that by what its actual cost is, which is defined by the true cost vector C. Okay? That's your regret. Regret shows up in lots of places, uh, so it's not unique to this setting. Um, lots of people in online learning use this as the central quantity to quantify, say, the effectiveness of a decision-making procedure, procedure over time. Um, but it's also central to the predict and optimize uh, framework either from a methodological perspective, so algorithm design, or just pure empirical evaluation perspective. Uh, in a sense, this is what you really care about. So if you think about the objective function as being, for example, in the space of dollars, uh, you know, any currency, time, etc., the regret is measuring how much you're losing because you're making suboptimal decisions because you're not getting the right optimization problem. Okay. All right, so, um, so this allows us to design a first high-level algorithmic strategy. Uh, what this algorithm strategy, algorithmic strategy uh, supposes is generally uh, two things. Number one, that your model um, is differentiable in some sense, okay, or at least sub-differentiable, so there needs to be some gradients. Uh, there are methods for predict and optimize that don't use differentiable models that you say decision trees, right? It wouldn't fit exactly within this loop I'm going to show, uh, but I'm happy to discuss them more uh, if you're interested. For now, I'm going to assume differentiable models. So you can start with the simplest linear regression model all the way to the deepest neural net. And I'll show you in PyEPO, we have some benchmarks where we do computer vision, very complex uh, ResNets um, within this framework, OK? So uh, the loop. A training here, training loop, assumes uh, a fixed feasible region. So here, for example, for an integer linear program, fixed coefficient matrix, fitch, fixed right-hand side B. If you have AX less than or equal to B or equal to B, I am assuming the constraints are fixed. So this is back to the question from before about can you predict in the constraints. For now, we're not going to assume uh, any predictions in the constraints. So the feasible set is fixed. That's why when I do shortest path, I fix the S and the T. Okay, because if you remember your intro linear programming uh, shortest path model, the constraints in the shortest path, say flow balance constraints, depend on whether the node is a source or a, or a, or a target. Right? So if, if you change the source and target, the feasible region changes, even if the graph is the same. So for shortest path, think my graph is unchanged and my source and target are unchanged. Okay? For the traveling salesperson problem, this means my cities are unchanged. For the knapsack problems, this means um, the weights of my items are fixed, but their values change or are predicted. Okay? In fact, in the lab later, we'll do knapsack. Okay, so training loop follows the usual uh, uh, ML nomenclature uh, for the different components. So you initialize your model uh, using some random initialization method. Then you have a bunch of epochs over your training set. Epochs here, one epoch means one pass over all your training data. Uh, but within each 
epoch or full path, you may split up the data into mini batches. Okay, so you have a thousand uh, training instances, you split them up into batches of 10, 10, 10, 100 times over. Okay, for each such batch or mini batch, which consists, remember, of feature vector, cost uh, coefficient vector. Um, so we look at the cost vectors. Uh, we predict using our current model, defined by theta, we get some c-hats. We compute the optimal solution of the problem using c-hat as the cost function. This gives us some solution. We use that to compute some loss for that c-hat, and then we backward propagate to update the parameters theta using the gradient of that loss. Okay? So this you can replace you know, predict and optimize with any standard regression classification. The only thing that differs is we need to invoke the solver. Okay, for most of the methods, when you do a forward pass, you need to invoke the solver. Okay, to see what is the quality of the current prediction. Again, not mean squared error, not regression error, but actual decision value, decision quality. Okay, so that's the high level training loop. Any questions on the pseudocode? Okay. Now, what is this gradient? Okay. Let's think about it a bit further. Uh, the gradient here, recall, is the gradient of your loss with respect to the parameters of your predictive model. Okay, that's theta. Using the chain rule, we can break up this gradient into the product of two other uh, gradients. So I'm going to bring in C hat, which is the predicted coefficients. And by chain rule, I can put it, you know, I can differentiate with respect to it here and get its derivative with respect to theta. There, this is still going to be equal to my original gradient. Okay, agreed? Good. Um, which of these two quantities is easy to compute based on what I've said? Without looking at the slides which TS just uploaded. So one of these is easy to compute, the other is hard to compute, based on everything I've described. N n not, not from people who have authored papers on the topic. Sorry? This one? OK, very good. So um, the answer is that the second term here is easy to compute. Uh, let's look at it uh, carefully. So it's just the gradient of the output of the model with respect to the parameters of the model. Right? This is very easy. If you have, say, a linear regression model, right? it's as if you have uh, you know, theta times x, the derivative is going to be x, which is the features. Right? If it's a neural net, you can invoke your favorite neural net package and ask it for uh, backpropagation. Okay? So, this object is very easy. In fact, any time you train any model with gradient descent, you compute this. This is the kind of the something you compute towards the end, okay? After the loss function in a backward pass. Um, so this is very easy to compute. What's difficult is the first term. If you read the first term, what is it saying? It's saying how does the decision loss, say something like regret, vary with the predicted costs? OK? So if we take L to be the regret, this is the question we're really asking. OK? As I make a you know, very small change to the predictions, how does the optimal value or the regret vary? All right. Why is this hard? Uh, because you need to say something or predict something about the change in the optimal solution of the problem, OK? So let's see why that's tricky. Um, if we take, for example, a linear program, OK? This is a figure from the Smart Predict and Optimize paper. If you take a linear program, we know that optimal solutions of linear programs are vertices, OK? Uh, or all vertices are optimal solutions, OK? For now, I'm assuming. The objective is not parallel to any, so there is no optimal face. Um, so every objective function has a unique optimal solution. That optimal solution is a vertex. Okay? 
let's assume I'm, I have some prediction, uh, you know, C star A. It gives me this optimal solution. Now I change this prediction slightly to C hat B. Okay? Because the optima are vertices, you have a jump in the optimal solution. Okay? A jump that's very abrupt, very discontinuous. Okay? There's nothing continuous or smooth here. Okay? Because you have such an abrupt change, computing any kind of gradient is not, is not, it's not well defined even here. Okay? So this quantity becomes very tricky. Okay? So the main contribution um, of the SPO plus uh, paper, which kind of s started this perspective on this problem. Again, there are many perspectives. Start the perspective I'm going to talk about today, which I like, um, is to say, although we cannot differentiate the regret, okay, we can do what we do anyway in machine learning, which is derive some easy to optimize upper bound on our loss and optimize that instead. Okay, why do I say? This is what you do in machine learning, because uh, in machine learning, if you're doing binary classification, what's the ideal loss function that you would like to have? Just binary classification. Zero, one loss function, right? If the prediction is correct, you get loss zero. If the prediction is incorrect, you get loss one, regardless of how far you are or how close you are to being correct. Okay? But we know that zero, one loss looks something like this, and it's you know, has gradients zero everywhere and discontinuous at zero. So what do you do? Support vector machines, the hinge loss. Okay? So the hinge loss is just a convex upper bound on the zero one loss. Okay? That's the motivation for it. You never design a loss function, uh, I mean, b before neural nets, now everything is out of the door. But classically, your loss function should be an upper bound on your loss. Because if you're minimizing the loss, Minimizing an upper bound of it is valid. If it's not a valid upper bound, there might be regions where you know, minimizing this surrogate is not the right thing to do. Okay? So you always look for an upper bound. So what El Mashtub and Grigas propose is the SPO plus loss, which you're going to use uh, in the tutorial. Um, and there's you know, not much uh, point in going through the details of why this is a valid loss function. All you need to know is a couple of things. Number one, this object here is a convex upper bound on the object above it. Okay? So upper bounds it, and it's convex. The other thing you need to know um, is that it requires solving an optimization problem. Okay? So you see inside this loss is a minimization problem. The minimization problem has some objective function. It's 2c hat, so the prediction minus c, the true uh, coefficients, times w, the variables. So you need to solve this subproblem to be able to even evaluate this loss. So already we're seeing that something expensive is going to be required to do this gradient descent. Okay? Think about your regular loss functions. If you're doing classification, you do binary cross-entropy, uh, you know, even multi-class classification, mean squared error, mean absolute error. All of these are very easy to evaluate. You just plug in your prediction, you compare it to something, and you calculate some norm. Right? Uh, this is not the case here. It's more sophisticated than that. But uh, it's convex, and it's an upper bound. More so, it has a subgradient. So although the function is not differentiable everywhere, it has subgradients. Okay? Um, and if you have subgradients and the function is convex, you can do subgradient descent. Okay? In fact, anytime you train a neural network, fully connected, say, with rectified linear units, you're not doing gradient descent. You're doing subgradient descent. Okay? Why? Because the ReLU is not uh, differentiable at zero. Okay? So the things you get, these are subgradients, technically. So nothing too different from that here. All right? So there's a computational overhead that comes from having to solve a minimization problem to evaluate the loss. Okay? That's why in the diagram I had before, I had an optimization solver you know, built in somewhere. So you usually need to invoke the solver every time you process a data point. Okay? 
So if you think about this in the big gradient descent loop, for every epoch, for every mini-batch, for every instance in every mini-batch, for this method, you need to invoke the, invoke the solver once. Okay? So potentially expensive, that's why you'll see the lab is nicely designed to be something you can run in two minutes and understand there. Uh, Large-scale problems would be out of scope, typically. Uh, we have to spend hours to train these models. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Uh, okay. So the question is, uh, can you give a high-level intuition for why the term at the bottom uh, upper bounds the, the term at the top? Uh, no, I really can't give an intuition. It, 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 the derivation is, is, comes from duality theory. If you're technical, I, I don't really have an intuitive sense. Yeah, I just compute it. Other questions? Yeah. Great. OK. Very good. Uh, so Tias can answer this question. Uh, so the question is, what if you cannot find an optimal solution to the problem, because maybe the problem is NP-complete NP or uh, NP-hard? Um, so what we can say, um, so as far as I know, uh, empirically, it's not too bad. So in a lot of cases, if it's an integer problem, maybe you solve its relaxation, and you take just the relaxed solution, and you use the, the value of that, okay, as a heuristic. And typically, it trains, okay? Maybe it takes some epochs more to converge, but the iterations are much faster, because you're solving a simpler optimization problem. Um, in theory, within the SPO plus framework, I, I actually don't have a good recollection of whether they study um, if you're doing approximate optimization. I tend to think it's OK if you have a guarantee on how good the approximation is. Yeah. Questions? Yes. OK, very good. So the question is, uh, uh, kind of, do we have to take gradients through the optimization procedure itself? OK? Uh, no, we don't. Right? So this is different from the class of methods that uh, Nando discussed yesterday, where uh, you might, for different cases, uh, because the neural net itself is your solver in some sense, you need to differentiate through the steps that lead to its predictions. Right? So here, you don't need any of that. Right? You just need to know the value. As for the other terms, uh, actually, the one on the, the rightmost term, z star c, is just the optimal value of the problem with the true coefficients. This one you can pre-compute. Pre so think of this as a constant. Uh, doesn't matter too much. And this one is easy to compute. It's the dot product of two times the predicted coefficients with the true optimal solution with respect to the cost. So. Uh, the gradient flow that you get is just from, uh, let me see if I have the gradient. Uh, I don't think I have the subgradient. Uh, no, so, so the subgradient is derived, to, it takes care of the two because it needs to depend, it depends on C hat, right? But, but you do not need to differentiate through the procedure itself. That's the charm of this approach. So it's a valid subgradient, so it satisfies, you know, the definition that it lower bounds the function, blah, blah, blah. But it does not require differentiating through any procedure. So whatever solves this problem is a black box. Yeah, very good question. All right. Question? Uh, so I was using shortest path, which is a linear program indeed. But in full generality, it, it need not be a linear program. If it's already easy, great. Um, but if it's not, then, then you might want to do some kind of relaxation. Yeah, good. Yes. OK. 
Okay, so the question is, can we not, uh, to eliminate computation overhead, replace the optimization problem with something that has to do with optimality conditions, okay, like KKT, et cetera? Um, and and uh, no, I don't think you can replace it, replace it, um, to get an upper bound. Maybe, maybe you could, but then you would get some very weak upper bound, because remember, the model predicts C hat. Now, which solution are you going to use to get optimality conditions at to argue this term? You, you need some solution. You, go, you need to go from C hat to solution of the problem using C hat of some sorts, right? So when you predict C hat, there isn't a solution other than just a solution with C, which is the original solution. Yeah. But methods like what Nando talked about yesterday, which rely on differentiating through a solver, do use the optimality conditions, yes. All right, good. So, in fact, uh, the procedure I just showed you, or the loss function and subgradient uh, we just discussed, are the ones that led to this funky-looking uh, uh, solution here, where you know the lines that you learn don't fit the data at all, but they give the regret of almost zero. Okay, so you act based on these predictions, you get near optimal solutions. Question. Great question. Do they always look like that? Uh, no, not really. Not really. So we'll see in the tutorial for Knapsack, uh, there are cases where they look similar to the true costs, and then you get a good solution. There are cases where they look dissimilar, and then you still get a very good solution. So it, it can happen both ways. And I'll show towards the end that empirically, you can do some things to try to get a bit of both. Okay. So maybe uh, to make it more uh, you know, of a thought experiment, you could imagine tilting these lines a little bit to move the breakpoint to the right, but not this much, for example, possibly. Yeah. But this method gives, in this case, these two. And they still work for our purposes. OK? Good. All right. So uh, now, uh, to, to move into the second method or class of methods, um, I want to change the setup a little bit, uh, the training data. Um, let's go back to the short ST shortest path example, where you have different times of day at which you want to predict the shortest path between uh, the blue and the yellow uh, squares. Um, let's assume, instead of observing the travel times on the edges, the Cs, you only observed some optimal solution. Okay, So you, you don't actually know what the travel times were. Uh, you just had, for example, uh, you're a package delivery company. You had a very skilled driver. They took a route, which was great. right? Uh, in fact, Amazon, a few years ago with MIT, they ran this last mile routing challenge, which some of you may have heard of, where they said, we propose routes to our drivers, but some of them go and do something completely different. We don't understand why. We know that they have tacit knowledge on the ground, meaning they take a left somewhere, they see there's construction, they take a right, they divert. It's not on the maps, it's not on the TSP solver from Amazon, it's nowhere in the company's view when they propose the route. Okay? So they said, as a challenge, here are some good routes, can you reverse engineer the process? So given the features of the routing instance, can you predict the solution that agrees with a good driver? Okay, it was a big challenge. In fact, it was won by non-machine learning methods, uh, by a team led by Bill Cook, who wrote Concord, which is the fastest TSP solver, by pure engineering. Uh, recently, we've applied some predict and optimize methods. We have some preliminary results, but nothing I can talk about yet. But such a problem, the challenge fits within this framework with some you know, uh, creativity. Uh, but let's assume for now that I don't observe the cost, I don't observe the travel times, I just observe optimal solutions, okay? So I know W star one was the right thing to do at 8 a.m., W star two was the right thing to do at 10 a.m., given these features, okay? For those of you who have thought about machine learning for combinatorial optimization, this is a little bit similar to say, saying I have a data set of TSP instances and corresponding optimal solutions computed by a MIP solver and say, can I figure out the solution? It's a little bit like that. 
Okay, uh, now that cannot be done uh, with the previous uh, method, okay? So, um, if we look at the SPO plus method, it requires knowing some C. It requires knowing the true costs, the true tra travel times, but now I don't have access to them anymore, okay? So I can't apply this method. Um, there's another set of methods coming from a group at uh, Google Research um, in Paris, I believe, uh, called the, the Differentiable Perturb Optimizers. They have a couple of papers. This is, uh, this is one of them. Um, and it, they, they did not think about them at all in the context of the predict and optimize problem. Okay? They were thinking about them uh, in terms of a structured prediction problem where you want to predict shortest path from features. And in machine learning, there is something called structured prediction where your output is not a label. It's not a regression value, it's not a class, it's a structured object, a tree, a path, a route. That problem has existed for decades and you can solve it with SVM and there's all kinds of ways to do it. So they were thinking about it from that perspective um, and uh, us and other people in the community have noticed that connection. So we went and implemented these seemingly different methods. They had not really contextualized them uh, from an you know, optimization perspective. Uh, but turns out they work great. I'll show in the experimental results, and you can also test them for yourself uh, in the lab. Uh, these methods, what they do is they say, um, you can estimate the gradient of something like the regret with respect to your predictions uh, by subtracting the, true va the value of the optimal solution. Okay, So you have the solution, so you compute the optimal value, um, and you compare that to the average of capital K sampled solutions, where each solution corresponds to a random objective function. The random objective function perturbs your prediction by some noise, okay? Um, it perturbs it, you solve the minimization problem K times, each time with different noise, okay? Um, you get some values, you take the average of that, um, and that's your estimate of the gradient. Okay, so they have a, basically a Monte Carlo simulation approach that uses some kind of random perturbation, and they have some accompanying theory to show that under some conditions, this is a reasonable estimate. Okay, again, estimate of the gradient uh, of the loss with respect to the predictions. Okay, now clearly this can be very expensive because you need to solve capital K optimization problems when. Earlier, I was already scaring you that you need to solve one optimization problem, right? Here, every time you process an instance in one batch, in one epoch, you need to solve potentially k. k may be 5, 10, something like that, okay? In practice, you can get away with k equals 1 in many cases, okay? So you can play with that um, in the tutorial later on and see if it works for Knapsack, for example. All right. Now, another class of... Uh, uh, methods, uh, so this is assuming again uh, back to the case where we do observe the coefficients. So I, I see some laughs in the front uh, because of this funky table that I made. But uh, there are a class of methods, I'm, I'm just going to talk about one representative method, which basically are trying to say we want to reduce calls to the solver okay, in this gradient descent loop. Can we get away with some supervised learning type surrogates okay, that avoid have, having to compute too much of these expensive, you know, subgradients uh, and so on. So um, I'm going to refer mostly to the uh, learning to rank paper uh, by uh, John Tamandi and, and co-authors here, um, which uses the following uh, very elegant, I don't, I don't say it because I'm invited, it's, a, it's an elegant idea indeed, uh, which I tried to illustrate here poorly. Um, so let's say you had three solutions to your binary, say, optimization problem, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Um, and let's consider two predictions of the objective function coefficients, prediction A and prediction B. Okay? Each prediction, you can take it, multiply it by the solution. Uh, sorry, you can take each prediction um, and see how good is that solution with respect to that uh, predicted cost vector. Okay? And then you can rank them accordingly. So let's say the true ranking with the true objective is Solution one is the best, solution two is the second best, solution three is the third best. Ideally, what you want is predictions of the cost which maintain this ranking, 
Why? Because you don't care about the actual value. If I rank the true optimal solution as optimal, I'm always going to get that when I optimize to the predicted uh, objective function coefficient. So now if you had two objective predictions, A and B, and one produced the ranking 1, 3, 2, and the other the ranking 3, 2, 1, clearly you would prefer prediction A. Okay? Its ranking is a little bit more consistent with the true ranking. Okay, so it only flips the last two. Now if I optimize with respect to the prediction, I still get solution one, as desired. I get the best solution. Okay? So then the idea can be summarized as learning to predict uh, coefficients for a feature vector. That result in a good ranking of solutions. For that, you need a pool of solutions. So what the proposed method there does is to collect such solutions during the gradient descent. Okay? So occasionally invoke the solver, get some optimal solution, put them in a database in a cache, right? And now just train a learning to rank model. You can check the paper for details, but uh, you know it's a very underrated idea, the, the learning to rank idea. I've used it for learning to branch. I, it keeps popping up in my work. Every three papers, I have a ranking formulation somewhere uh, because it's a little bit more refined than classification. Classification is a bit too harsh. 0, 1, right? Uh, and less label intensive than regression, okay? And the loss function is having more structure than am I correct or am I not, okay? Um, and so there's multiple versions, and you'll see in the tutorial um, recently uh, they were implemented in Paepo uh, by Senna, I don't know who's here, and uh, you can try them. Okay, I picked an example where they, they, they work well because TS is going to be here, so. Um. Okay, all right. So, uh, any questions on the methodology uh, side of things? Yes. Yes. Um, using the LP relaxation enough times within the, this uh, this map. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I don't have them here. I have them. We have them in the empirical results in the paper accompanying the package, uh, which validate the results uh, from TS Group uh, from before. That yeah, you can basically replace this with the optimal LP value. And, and you're probably going to be fine, yeah. But it's just an empirical finding. I don't think we understand fully why it works, but there are cases where you can justify why it works. So there are combinatorial problems for which the integrality gap, which is the gap in value between the LP optimum and the IP optimum, is bounded, right, in a very specific way. So you know that the error is bounded. But it works sometimes even when you don't have that uh, empirically, right? So. When it's bounded, when integrality gap is bounded, I think that's clear explanation. Otherwise, kind of empirical magic. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, yeah. W star C is just the optimal solution with respect to the true cost. I don't need to know what it is. I'm just assuming I have it. So think of this as W star, forget about the C. I, I assume I have this in my data. So here I'm putting C, assuming that there is some underlying C that I don't observe. But you, know, you, you don't actually need C, yeah. Solution, yes, correct. So this is the value of the observed optimal solution. But for us, the value corresponds to some objective. So within the setting, so I'm assuming there is some objective C, I just don't observe it. That's why I write it as W star C, to say that it's this solution multiplied by a vector C. But the method doesn't know C. Yeah. Uh, okay, good, good question. So is there a connection uh, between what's on the slide and inverse optimization? So uh, let me work through it. Uh, with everyone. So in inverse optimization, the assumption is the following. You have an optimization problem. You observe solutions to it, but also non-solutions. 
Okay? You might observe, for example, in other settings, optimal solutions and suboptimal solutions. And the task is, can I figure out what the true objective is? What the correct objective is that would have yielded such solutions? Right? Um, so this can be thought of somehow indirectly it's doing inverse optimization. I mean, you're right. Because at the end of the day, the model predicts some C. Yeah. And I need to go back a little bit, but basically here, this cone that you see, basically what it's saying is the following. If, let's say, the true cost is this one, minus C. All the objectives in this cone, if you optimize with respect to them, they give you the same optimal solution, right? So in a way, the task of inverse optimization here is to figure out the right cone, right? So not, there's not only one unique C which gives that solution. There are many possible Cs. And this should help you see why it's the decision error that you care about and not the mean squared error, right? Because, yeah, you might basically, let's say your C is here, and then your prediction is here. Mean squared error can be very small, but the gap will be very big. Whereas you can be very far here, but still give the same solution. Yeah. Yes? Uh huh. Correct. I agree. Okay, good. Um, so now let me uh, talk a little bit about the software side of things and some uh, empirical findings. Uh, so again, I'd like to credit uh, Bo, my, my student, who's done an incredible job at setting up IEPO and uh, continuously testing it and uh, maintaining it. Um, you can check out this documentation during the tutorial uh, to help you with any functions, although you know, I try to kind of uh, keep it as self-contained as possible, but you might still want to refer to some aspects of the documentation. Um, the key uh, you know, ideas in PIEPO uh, are to integrate the optimization modeling side with the learning side, and then some benchmarking and experimentation uh, facilities to just facilitate reproducible research in this area. So as part of it, we have benchmarks which are ways to generate you know, data sets of these optimization instances uh, for some canonical uh, problems, shortest path, knapsack, TSP, and so on. They're parameterized so you can ma make the mapping from features to costs you know, more or less nonlinear, more or less noisy, and so on. Uh, these are based on some conventions now in the literature that people have been doing for a while, which generate you know, somewhat reasonable data. Uh, I'll show you more synthetic data in a bit that is a little less synthetic uh, than this. Uh, and people have recently been applying such methods to real problems on real data. So, uh, but for the purposes of PIEPO so far, uh, because real data is a little bit hard to you know, put together and uh, make public, we have these synthetic benchmarks. Uh, on the optimization modeling side, it's very easy to bring your own solver. Okay, So there's native integration with Pyomo and Gurobi. Pyomo is a common language uh, or a modeling tool in operations research, um, which can plug into other solvers. So you can use Gurobi from Pyomo, et cetera. Uh, we have native support for Gurobi. And uh, well, now I have uh, support for uh, CPMPy through the tutorial. So you see, it's very easy uh, to use it. But you can also have your custom solver. So uh, there was a question before, you know, isn't shortest path easy? Um, yes, that's why you can just have a class which implements Dijkstra's, right? Uh, you can have your own exact algorithm for any problem. Uh, you just need to implement it uh, you know, by inheriting from a certain class and provide certain functions so that we're able to invoke your solver in a systematic way and then apply any of these methods that I talked about. Um, on the ML modeling side, uh, native support for PyTorch, for anything that you want to write as a neural net that's differentiable, uh, but also scikit-learn. So if you want to do non-differentiable uh, approaches, also not end-to-end, -end, meaning you just want to build a predictive model that predicts by minimizing mean squared error, you can use scikit-learn for that. So you can put a random forest, um, you know, gradient-boosted uh, tree, whatever it is that you want, that's in scikit-learn. 
and just train that to predict C hat that is close to C. Okay? And then we just use that. So we'll see in the experimental result when this method is good and when it's not. Okay? Um, and then in terms of training algorithms, uh, yeah, SPO plus, SPO plus with relaxations uh, from TS group, uh, the perturbed optimizer method. Check. Okay, great. Um, so uh, in terms of methods, uh, yeah, the last one I was discussing is the differentiable black box method. Some of you may have seen papers called differentiating through black box combinatorial solvers that attracted lots of attention. Uh, and we've also implemented it, although empirically we haven't been able to get it to produce as good results uh, as, as, uh, as we'd like. Uh, and also as of last week, we have the learning to rank methods uh, that I mentioned earlier, and uh, one more uh, noise contrastive uh, estimation method from, uh, from Maxim here, okay? Uh, so these are the methods that we have in addition to the two-stage method. Again, predict just with mean squared error and then optimize separately. So the non-end-to-end -end, uh, approach. So when I say these are available, it means we've already implemented the loss function, the subgradient, whatever it is that's necessary. And now we, we're also happy to accept contributions. So uh, you know, make a pull request if you have a new method uh, that's published or that works really well uh, and will kind of uh, make sure the code fits within our code base and test it and so on and add it uh, to this growing uh, repository of, of methods, okay? So for example, uh, to benchmark for the shortest path, uh, we have the synthetic data generation processes. Um, and I just want you to give a sense, I just wanted to give a sense because this is relevant to the, to the lab itself. Of course, synthetic data is not ideal. It's not what you eventually want to apply this method to, right? But it helps us benchmark, understand limitations, and so on. So for example, um, for shortest path, what we do is we generate grid graphs that look like this with, uh, or larger than this. You can specify the dimension of the grid um, with uh, ST uh, source target corresponding to northwest, uh, southeast uh, nodes. And then you have a bunch of parameters that regulate the mapping from feature vector to cost, okay? Um, there's also some random noise, and there's some polynomial degree which regulates how nonlinear the mapping is. So if degree is one, you have something like a linear mapping. If degree is two, three, four, five, six, it means the mapping is very highly nonlinear. So x comes in, C comes out, but the function is something crazy, right? So this means that if you fit a linear model, that might be a little bit tricky, right? Tricky to capture those coefficients. Um, the, the thing that needs to be learned really is, for example, in this case, this B matrix, which is a matrix of dimension uh, number of uh, costs, so number of decision variables times uh, times number of features, okay? Uh, so this is an unknown matrix. We generate it at random in advance. You never see it unless you're generating data. Um, and then you run it through this uh, complicated function, and that's the mapping. And if you fit a model, it should somehow figure out a way to reverse this mapping, right? Um, so we have this other data set, which is based on the differentiation of black box combinatorial solvers paper, which I think is a synthetic, but you know, really nice data set. Uh, it consists of terrains from the Warcraft game, okay, on which we want to do shortest path. Okay, so uh, these are, for example, uh, 96 by 96 RGB grids, right? So think computer vision, convolutional networks, that kind of thing, okay? So the grid looks something like this, uh, and it's easier to traverse through the green than it is to traverse through, uh, you know, the rocks, the mountains, or the water, okay? 
So the matrix here is a matrix of traversal costs, with blue being cheap, and you know as you get more green, it's more expensive. So you can see the correspondence between the two. Okay, and uh, there's an optimal solution from northwest to southeast. You can see it here. Um, what's interesting is the original image is in 96 by 96 dimensional, but we do the planning in much smaller dimensional space, 12 by 12. So any model needs to take this image and figure out that you average out every four, every square of four pixels. So you, you do average pooling, really. So it needs to figure out the pooling operation, so it likely needs to be a convolutional network okay, to figure this out. Um, and they have this data set, which you can uh, download from, uh, from linked in that paper. We also link it in the repository. Okay, so it's a, it's a nice data set. The reason why I like it is it forces you to train more complicated models than usual. Okay, so a linear model is not really gonna go far here. Why? Because your input is 96 by 96 by three. So that's roughly 30,000 dimensional. If you flatten that, okay, now your, your fully connected neural net is gonna be huge. Your linear model is not gonna do anything really. Okay, this is not MNIST. In MNIST you can get away with flattening the picture because it's grayscale, right? And it's also much smaller than 96, 96. It's like 28, 28, right? So 784. This is one to two orders of magnitude larger. Okay, so it forces you to do something more complicated. I'll show you one way to attack this. Uh, which we have in the benchmarks. Um, now, in terms of actual implementation, how can you use PyEPO to um, run a predict and optimize uh, experiment? So this is an example we have in the, in the paper and the, in the repository that uses uh, Gurobi. Um, because we have native support for Gurobi, we have a subclass called opt-Gurobi model, uh, in which here we're trying to do knapsack. Okay, so maximize value of chosen items. What you're predicting here is gonna be the values of the items, the CIs, subject to a bunch of knapsack constraints. So this is a multi-dimensional knapsack, so not just one, uh, but three in this case. Um, and you can implement the model like this. So this is standard uh, Gurobi. You need to tell us what the sense of the model is, maximize or minimize, otherwise we assume uh, minimize, I think. And then uh, you just need to return a model object, which can then be called to be solved, and then your decision variables, okay? And then you create a model by using this. So you'll do exactly this in the lab, except what's gonna be inside here is gonna be a CPMPy a knapsack model, okay? Um, and there's a bunch of other functions here I haven't uh, put because this is Gurobi. We have integrated support for solve, so when we, invoke a forward pass that needs to solve an optimization model, we know how to call optimize in Gurobi. If you come with your own solver or for the lab with CPMPy, you'll see I have a function there which says, you know, uh, solve model or something like that, which is then gonna involve cpmpy's.solve function, okay? In fact, in that lab, I use Gurobi under the hood with CPMPy as the backend solver, okay? So everything is kind of coming together uh, in, this, uh, in this circle. Okay, so uh, to create a data set, again, you'll see this in the, in the tutorial, there's some facilities that we leverage from PyTorch, uh, which are uh, really useful. So we need a data set object, so we have a class for that. Uh, it takes an optimization model, like the one I just showed you, some features and some costs, and now you have a data set object. Um, and then if you want to use uh, any PyTorch models, right, you need to put this data in a data loader that PyTorch understands, such that you can iterate over it in the gradient descent loop. So this uses the data loader from PyTorch utilities. You can tell it what the batch size is, how many instances do you take in every pass um, on top of your data set. And then you can iterate over it, so here X, C, W, Z are the features, the true costs, the true optimal solutions, and the true optimal values. This forms the basis of the data set, okay? So this is a training data set. 
um, then you can initialize a model. In this case, it's a linear regression model using PyTorch. Okay. Um, so this is all, you know, superclassing from PyTorch. Uh, of course, PyTorch is a neural network package, but a linear model can be implemented uh, in PyTorch, no problem. Why? Because PyTorch provides linear layers. Okay. So you just say, I have this many features, and I have this many costs I want to predict. What this does is it's going to create a multi-output linear regression models. Okay. So features come in. Uh, pred end predictions come out, D predictions put out, whatever number of variables, and you implement the forward pass. Okay? So what's going to happen under the hood is anytime we're going to get gradients, everything is going to flow smoothly. Why? Because we implement all the methods I discussed in PyTorch. Okay? So everything is autograd compatible. Okay? So here's a training loop. If you're a PhD student doing any machine learning, you must have I've written a few hundred of these. Um, so we create an optimizer from PyTorch, and then we iterate for every epoch, for every mini batch. We make a prediction. We measure the loss. Here, the SPO plus loss. We zero out the gradients. We get the new gradients by invoking the backward function on the loss. And then we update the parameters by taking an optimizer step. OK? Should be familiar to everybody, or most of you. Um, and with that, you can get a nice converging curve like this. I can't guarantee it every time, but in this case, we got one. Okay, any questions? You can ask me more about the software uh, once you're uh, using the code app later on. Okay. Now, some empirical finding. Part of the reason why we built all of this was, uh, you know, methods were coming out, different people using different benchmarks, different metrics. Etc. So we, we just wanted to understand, uh, as a starting point, kind of the lay of the land and be able to compare everything on an equal uh, basis. So in the paper on archive, which is linked on the PyPo repository, you can see, you know, results on all kinds of variations. Uh, I'm just going to discuss what I think are some, uh, you know, interesting findings. But a lot of our plots look something like this. Um, so. Here we're doing shortest. Uh, we're doing traveling salesperson problem with 1,000 training instances, um, and the function that maps features to cost can have a polynomial degree that ranges from linear to quadratic to degree six polynomial. Okay. Each of these colored uh, box plots represents a method. Okay, and these are regret results on the unknown, unseen test set. Okay, so we trained these methods using the package, and now we're testing them on unseen instances. Okay? When you do regret, you want to be closer to zero. So here, lower is better. Okay? Um, as you go from left to right, the learning problems becomes harder because the function you're learning is more nonlinear. Okay? Um, and interesting methods that you know you want to look at here are uh, the green one, which is two-stage linear regression. So just learn to predict the coefficients. Don't do any end-to-end -end learning. This is the green one. And the SPO plus method, which I mentioned the first method, which does end-to-end -end learning using this special subgradient in orange. So you can see typically one trend I want you to observe here is end-to-end -end learning in orange beats two-stage linear regression. But the twist is that you can do two-stage random forests. This is the pink method. And it's actually not so bad. Okay, So it's kind of close. Um, you can do more of Lars' uh, tutorial and do auto-tuning of scikit-learn within the two-stage method. Um, and in this case, you do terrible. But we have some results in the paper where it does better. But the key thing I wanted to say is give it limited time tuning the hyperparameters might not be sufficient. So in this case, basically, we couldn't give it enough time to get the tuner to converge. But maybe we're using the wrong tuner in that case. Um, OK. So uh, what I want you to take from this is that in the smart predict and opt in the predict and optimize setting, if you have more data, okay, doing the two-stage approach of just predicting coefficients by minimizing mean squared error, might be sufficient. Okay, so if you have a real application or you're embarking on research in this setting, 
don't think about the large scale data regime. You're gonna lose to the two stage method there. Okay, I, gonna, I can guarantee that. Uh, and we can show that empirically. So random forests with 5,000 training points for the traveling salesperson problem can outperform any of the end-to-end -end methods. Okay, with less data they don't. This is actually validated by the theory. So in the predict and optimize paper, they say explicitly that in the limit of large data, you don't need to do any of this stuff. You just learn an accurate regression model. Okay? Why? Because you're gonna converge to zero error at the end. So you're predicting the coefficients essentially exactly. Okay? So if the data is, if the function is easy enough and you have enough data, you don't need to do any of this end-to-end -end stuff. You just learn to regress. Predict, then optimize separately. Okay? The other thing I wanted to say is that you can get potentially the best of both worlds. So this plot is showing two things. Think of this as, you know, by objective optimization, Pareto front type thing, mean squared error of the coefficients as measured by this formula versus the regret. Every circle is a method. You want to be in the bottom left corner, okay? If you're, if you're here, you have zero mean squared error, zero regret, perfect, okay? Closer you are, the better. Uh, the circle sizes correspond to training time. So bigger circle means more expensive to train, okay? So what you can see in this plot is that there's you know, a few methods that are kind of on the Pareto frontier. Um, the two are SPO plus with L2 regularization and PFYL, the perturbed optimizer method, with L2 regularization. They take some time to train, but they achieve a decent trade-off between regret, so the lowest regret among competing methods, and decent mean squared error. Doing two-stage random forest gives you better mean squared error but worse regret, okay? So this is kind of the Pareto frontier here, okay? Um, but if you basically regularize the loss function with L2 on the predicted coefficients and you tune the weight of that lambda that weighs the regularization well, you can potentially get the best of both. Okay, um, and I, I feel like this is the advisable approach in practice because you don't want to give a practitioner predictions that don't make any sense, meaning they are orders of magnitude different from what they would expect. They might take that and say, I'm not too sure I can optimize with respect to your predictions, even if the predictions are good for the decision, right? So with some tuning, to get the L2 regularization weight, you have to do some hyperparameter tuning, might be simple grid search, uh, but it's advisable that you do that, okay? Um, the other experiment I want to show is back to the Warcraft uh, data set. Uh, what we actually show there is you can use residual networks, so in particular, five layers of the ResNet 18, a very popular uh, convolutional neural network architecture uh, to do this problem. Um, but it turns out, because there is enough data, I think there's 10,000 training data points, and ResNet is extremely powerful. If you look at the regret of the two-stage method of just take this map in, produce this map out, so this is the two-stage method without any solvers, any end-to-end -end stuff, achieves near optimal regret. The second best method, or you know, tied for best, is the SPO plus method I showed. Other methods do a little bit worse. PFYL, which is the perturbation-based one, which does not need to see this matrix, it learns only from the solutions, if you recall, can also achieve almost zero regret, which is very impressive. Okay, it doesn't need to know the costs. It predicts them by looking only at the solution, okay? uh, which I find really impressive. What it does better, though, is to match the true ground truth path. So here you have path accuracy, so if you compare one to one, Hamming distance of predicted path through optimal path, how much do they match? Higher is better match. This method, the PFYL, the perturbation-based one which doesn't see the costs, has the highest. It almost matches the solution most of the times, okay? So it's very efficient at doing that and getting you good coefficients and low regret, okay? Which is a finding that to us is, is new, okay? All right, so uh, to wrap up, uh, I'd like to say that predict and optimize is becoming increasingly more practical uh, as a solution paradigm for problems where you have context and optimization problems. I will say this is one perspective again because 
For example, in operations research, people look at it from the stochastic optimization perspective. Uh, there are different perspectives to the problem, okay? Um, and uh, maybe Michele will talk about some perspectives. Nando talked about some perspectives, etc. No pressure. Um, so there are a suite of methods that are effective. Uh, in fact, I put only here SPO plus and PFYL because those are the ones we've run all experiments uh, for. Uh, the noise contrastive and the learning to rank uh, are gonna be experimented with soon. So we will publish those results and we'll see if they stand the, the test of uh, our grueling uh, experimentation. Uh, and the naive two-stage approach is sufficient when you have large-scale data. Um, and there are some uh, open questions on you know, reducing training time. This is a continuous effort, and lots of people are working on it. Uh, you want to solve as few optimization problems as, as, as possible in training, but it's by no means completely solved. Uh, predictions in the constraints, which was raised uh, very early on, um, where in many cases, for example, you're doing inventory management, and what you need to predict is something about the demand. Right? And the demand is not in the objective, it's in the constraint. Or you're doing surgery scheduling, and you need to predict the length of a surgery, and that's in the constraints because you have overtime limits and surgeon limits and so on. We're actually working with a practical case of that sort. The methods I described don't work really for that. Okay? Um, and the intuitive reason is all these losses and gradients and subgradients, they all rely on the problem remaining feasible. If your predictions are in the constraints and your problem can jump from feasible to infeasible, it's unclear what the loss of that is. It's like infinity, okay? Uh, but there are some uh, recent works uh, under some assumptions that try to apply this paradigm. So I'd invite you to check out the CPIOR paper which was presented last month um, in Nice. Okay, uh, last, just relevant to the theme, I'd just like to advertise some of the other speakers, they refer to me and they say, uh, you know, Elias is going to talk about this in his talk, but, you know, I don't have time to talk about this other stuff. Uh, but relevant to ML4CP, uh, I'd like to say ML4CP is relatively more recent than ML4IP, so there's a lot of stuff in the integer programming space. I've worked on some of them, um, and also not beyond MIP on various other solving paradigms. So it's a rich area. Uh, don't check out my not up-to-date website. Check out my Google Scholar for the actual... Um, papers. So with that, I'll stop here and take questions. And this is the link for the lab if you like to prepare uh, mentally. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, good. Okay, good. So this relates again to the question of uh, the feasible set and the constraints. Okay, so for example, in the shortest path, the shortest path polytope, the feasible region, differs if you change the graph or the SNT, because the formulation relies on, it's a flow formulation, so whether you have plus one or minus one or zero on the right-hand side depends on whether the node is a source or target. So then if you jump from one to the other, technically the instance is different. Now, practically, if it's the same network, you can still use the same model to make predictions. I don't see that as empirically as a, pr as a problematic issue, okay? Theoretically, the framing of the problem assumes a fixed feasible region. Yeah. I, I haven't really thought hard, maybe other people have, if the feasible region changes. I know in practice we can do it, but I, I, and we've done it. Um, but I don't know theoretically that the, all the theory from predict and optimize is for a fixed feasible region. So actually, Google claimed that that's what they do. Um, and, and you could apply, you could train a GNN in this setting using end-to-end -end learning like we do here. In the benchmarks, we don't. We just train like a linear regression model from features of the edge to cost. But 
uh, I think DeepMind published a few years ago that Google travel time prediction is done with graph neural nets. Uh, but they don't, in at least what they describe there, is not decision aware. It's just doing regression. So it's like the two-stage approach. But Google has essentially infinite data. So one, one could argue that they're in the limit of large data where you don't have to do end-to-end -end learning and you can just predict coefficients directly. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. No. For, uh, Uh, you will do that in your lab. So sigma, sigma in the lab, in the tutorial. Uh, you, you, can, you can set it. Uh, we found some setting which was in the paper which worked for shortest path. We didn't have to tune it too much. Uh, um, you, you can change it. So the package allows you to change it. But for these experiments, I think it was fixed for the results that I showed. And it works surprisingly well, yes. Uh, in the ones that I showed, it's one, yeah, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't understand why that there's no averaging. Somehow it works. I don't know. Maybe the shortest path and TSP are just too simple, uh, you know. The, yeah, there's something across the mini batch that still gives some signal. That's the averaging that's happening. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, good. We have consensus. So the averaging is coming from the mini batch, because what I showed is the gradient estimate. And eventually, you're going to average that. So you're indirectly getting multiple perturbations because your batch size is more than one. Good. Great. Other questions? All right. Then thank you very much. Do you have any announcement to make? Or? Uh, well, thank you. That was a very nice, nice talk. Thanks for the invitation.